I believe we're at the midst uh, of, of twin revolutions. Of course, we're sitting in the heart of a, the technological revolution that we already know about. But we're also realizing that while technology can increase productivity, we're also finding that we can't increase the amount of workload and stress and strain on the same individual and still hope to maintain those same levels of productivity and profitability. The second realization and revolution will be the idea that we can increase productivity by increasing optimal human uh, flourishing. And that's what I want to talk about today, about that research. We were asked to talk about one thing that was, uh, 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 that we were going to put out there that, uh, that was going to start a debate. And what I would like to argue is that you are not just your genes and your environment, that scientifically, happiness can be a choice. But a choice that we can influence through our organizations. And when we do so, it becomes the greatest competitive advantage in the modern economy. This is my third time out speaking at Google. One of the times I came here was with uh, Ming Tan to do a Google talk. And while I was talking to him, I started noticing all these uh, comparisons between what we saw at Google and what I was seeing during my 12 years at Harvard. Uh, for example, when I talk uh, to my friends from Waco, Texas, where I grew up about going off to Harvard, they say, why would you study happiness there? They seem to have everything, opportunities, resources, wealth, successes. Uh, and when I was at Google, I was talking to people and I asked them if they walked around in a constant state of ecstasy and, <laughs> and, and one of the women in the accounting department said with sheepishly that she actually felt very frustrated sometimes on Fridays because she would see the line for the free sushi and it was way too long. <laughs> How is she expected to be productive when the line is that long, I ask you. <laughs> but what I started realizing was it wasn't about the external world that causes people to become happier. And that's not what causes Google to be so successful, as Laszlo was mentioning earlier. What I want to talk about is what I was seeing at Harvard. One of the very first studies I did was the study of 1,600 Harvard students. I was looking to see, can you predict in a population that's very intelligent, very successful, very creative, who will rise to the top in terms of levels of happiness and success while they're there? I looked at everything. We asked uh, their familial income, their SAT scores. We looked at their uh, uh, GPA, we looked at the number of clubs that they were involved in, we found out the number of romantic relationships, which we found at Harvard was on average less than one per Harvard student. Uh, <laughs> which is why many people come out to Stanford, and we found it was... <laughs> 0.5 sexual partners per Harvard student, which I only mentioned because I still have no idea what that statistic even means. <laughs> we were always taught to round up, but... <laughs> 0.5 sexual partners was the equivalent of second base, and it was useless information to us. Um, but imagine a student who, ever since they were a one-year-old, was placed into a crib, wearing a onesie that you can buy at the bookstore that says, bound for Harvard, and maybe a cute little Yale hat in case something terrible happened. <laughs> and ever since they were in pre-K uh, pre, pre school, which they got into four years before they were conceived, they were the top 1% of their class. Junior high, high school, standardized test, top 1%. They walk into Harvard and they have a terrible realization, one that many people when they come to Google have as well. They suddenly realize that 50% of them are now below average. To put it more poignantly, when I talked to these students, uh, I said, it seems based upon my research that 99% of you will not graduate in the top 1%, <laughs> which they don't find that funny either. <laughs> But the reason that's interesting is they've decided to pin their levels of happiness on a future success which is related to something small, like grades, which if you know the statistics on grades, I can roll a pair of dice and that's equally predictive of your future job income as your college GPA actually is. But they can sign 99% to unhappiness and the top 1% when we study them is actually not that happy either. The system is broken. It's based upon a flawed system of happiness and success, a formula for it, which is at the heart of my research. What I do is I study uh, uh, what I believe to be one of the fundamental problems that is causing us to limit both our happiness and success within organization. And it's the formula we get there. And it's the way that we manage, the way that we parent, and it's the way that we uh, do self-development. Most people follow the formula, which is if you work harder, you're going to be more successful. As soon as you achieve these goals, think how happy you're going to be. Think how often we do that. As soon as I finish this project, then I'll be happier. As soon as I finish this presentation, then I'm going to feel happier. As soon as I finish all this travel, then I'll feel happier. As soon as I get into the right school, I'll feel happier. As soon as I get the right job, I'll feel happier. But what we notice is that formula, which undergirds most of our parenting styles and organizations, is scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. The first reason is every time your brain has had a success in the past, what have you done? You've changed the goalpost of what success looked like almost immediately. You got good grades in school, don't get excited yet, you don't even have a job. You get a job, <laughs> That's, that's great, you have a job, but now you have to hit your sales target. Well, you hit your sales target, that's great, but we're gonna raise your sales target for the next quarter, right? So, and each moment, we want to see sales rise, we want to see growth improve, we want to see uh, grades improve. That's not the problem. The problem is where happiness lies in the formula for our managing our organizations and our first selves. What we found is if happiness is not on the opposite side of success, you pushed it over the cognitive horizon. Your brain never quite gets there because it's a moving target. But flip around the formula, if you cause people to invest in uh, uh, their social support networks, deep 
deepen their social support networks, raise their levels of optimism, and change the way that they view stress from a threat to a challenge. It turns out every single business and educational outcome we know how to test for rises dramatically. We find